when they asked for a title, I thought uh, PCI 2.0 would probably be a good way to look at this because it's, uh, it's, uh, it, this, this isn't a mic. On, so I'll, I'll try and talk loud, so let me know if you can't hear me. But uh, I don't think we've got a mic in the room. This one's just for, uh, for, um, for recording. Um, so yeah, PCA 3.0 is, is probably a better way for us to think about it because it's one of those technologies that we put out there, uh, it fell off, we put it out there again, it fell off, and now it, it really seems like um, it's, it's keeping traction and we're starting to see it in farms now that we put it in and now we've kept it in for two, three years. So I think it's, it's pertinent for us to talk about it. The other thing that's interesting about this and why it's a bit of a timely uh, subject is as we raise our hands in here, there's 40, 50 percent of the room that's using it, and then the rest of the room isn't using it yet. So what's the difference between farms that are implementing it and farms that are not? I think Purdue completed a recent survey and uh, relatively similar numbers with regard to 40 percent of the industry using PCI at this time. It'll be fun to interact with you guys here over the next 45 minutes. Uh, so like we talked about, PCI is not a new technology. Uh, been used a long time in a lot of different species. Um, a couple of, couple of reasons why PCI hasn't really worked um, is that catheters have been um, a frustrating part of it is with regard to the material and consistency of that material. Uh, I think we've continued through some of the genetics research to understand what's the value of the bore index and how do we drive that and grow finish. Um, we continue to get better with regard to labor management and training. And then uh, if the economic value was there in the past, we'd use it. So obviously the economic value hasn't necessarily been there or a very good return on investment for us to invest in the technology and move forward with it. As we think about the different types of AI, we've, we've really transitioned through the years. I can remember, but we used to have a 300 South Fair to finish farm and uh, we had d double bore pens and a open pen and you'd run the, the, the sour gilt that was in heat there. Actually, we, the way we got bread, gilt spread back in the day is we'd pick them all out of the finisher, we'd put them out in pasture first part of the summer after we were put rings in them, anything that came back out of the pasture in the, at the end of summer with a belly on her stayed, and that was the replacement gilts for the year. So we moved from that to the boar breeding, and then uh, I can remember moving to AI with Dad, and now we're moving uh, as we continue to try and move, move down the line. Our, our goals with that have been very simple. How do we, how do we really drive uh, genetic indexing and spreading out high performance bores over, over more sows? And with that has come some of the health control uh, opportunities with regard to um, artificial insemination. So we've moved um, from traditional mating uh, where we were um, breeding those sows, gilts with 60 to 80 billion sperm cells to the traditional AI, most of those are still around that two and a half, three billion uh, dose um, on traditional AI, and now we're moving to uh, PCI, which, which is anywhere from a 0.5 to 1.5 billion doses. Most of what I see continues to be around the 1.5 billion doses. Um, with that's come, uh, we talked a little bit on the first presentation this morning about labor and how we're gonna how we're gonna save labor with regard to the sow farm. So that's changed our mating and, and insemination time from five, 10 minutes to uh, three to five minutes, and now uh, really 10 to 15 seconds to actually complete the AI event, uh, but you've still got to add in some heat check time on top of that. As you think about, um, I wanted to just go back through the basics of breeding, and I think it's important as, as we continue to train teams and whatnot they, that you just go back and, and remember you got to start at the basics. Um, with regard to uh, what's a little bit of the, uh, how does reproduction work and the hormones and that. As we think about um, putting three billion sperm into the, trying to put that into the reproductive tract of the sow and uh, how many we get out on total born, there's only about 0.3% of sperm that actually reach the oviduct or the site of, um, site of fertilization there. So uh, we lose, uh, we go from three billion to 10,000 most of that's just leakage out of the vagina and cervix, so it never actually makes it into the uterus. And then the uterus, you've got to remember that you're putting a foreign protein into the body of another animal. And so she is going to react to that in, in a bit of an immune response to try and clear whatever that foreign protein is. 
part of the hormone cycles there dampen that immune response, but a lot of that semen does get um, phagocytized before it uh, reaches the oviduct. Sperm then are released from the oviduct towards the site of fertilization, so they believe that there's only really about 100 sperm, sperm that are present where fertilization takes place uh, there in the reproductive tract. Um, is your teaching reproduction in farms? We've usually got a dead sow or two, so one of the things that, that's been really good with regard to teaching this and PCAI has just been to necropsy one and cut out the reproductive tract and make sure that everybody gets to visualize what they, what they don't get to visualize as they're breeding or sleeving sows and doing that. So um, again, they've got to, the teams need to understand um, that you know, you're, where the cervix is located and then you've got these long uterine horns uh, ovary and then where fertilization actually takes place here in, um, in this oviduct. Also, um, you can cut open that cervix and show them um, where they're seeding, seeding that rod and then where they're running the PCI catheter. So I think as you do training and teaching, uh, this, is, this is free material for you to go ahead and euthanize a sow if you've got a, a dead gilt and can lay those out side by side. It uh, really helps everybody understand what am I feeling when I'm trying to breed these sows PCAI. Additionally, as we think about success and failure of PCAI, uh, you've got less room for error because we're, we're, tr we're trying to reduce the dose size. And so the, the, the core things about heat check and timing of insemination and, and deciding which, which sows to breed is still very important. Uh, that, that timing insemination is important because we've we got to continue to remind everybody um, how that cycle works. So, as she, as she goes into standing heat over a two to three day period, um, ovulation typically occurs somewhere 38 to 48 hours after the start of, uh, of the detection of heat. One of the things you've got to remember is that we typically detect heat once a day, so understanding whether you're, you found it at time zero or time 24 hours um, between there are, um, is some of that variation, and then you just get uh, quite a bit of sow to sow variation with regard to how she comes into heat. You want, um, you want semen into that sow about 24 hours, or um, it needs to be less than 24 hours prior, prior to ovulation. So ser sperm can survive within the uterus for up to 24 hours. It takes about eight hours from insemination of that sow until the sperm capacitates or is able to, to uh, actually fertilize an oocyst. Oocysts only survive about 12 hours. Um, so your, your window here is um, only about 12 hours for those to survive um, before, so that they can still, um, um, still unite with the sperm. Capacitation, um, a lot of times we don't necessarily talk about this and it's, um, just one of the things to point out with regard to raw sperm that goes into the reproductive tract is not fertile right away. It has to go through some changes in the acrosome in order for it to become fertile. And so that, that capacitation period from when the uterus is inseminated is about eight hours. We've got a lot of, uh, well, we've got some reproductive tools. Um, and so as we think about what's, where do we go in the future here, some of these things uh, that we've been trying to do is lower the doses on AI. So we're going to talk again today about PCAI, but there's going to be next or steps on this. And there's a number of companies that are working on how do we really reduce the dosage even further? So can I do deep uterine insemination and really try and take that dose down from 1.5 billion to half a billion or a hundred, a hundred thousand sperm so that I can really spread out those bores. Uh, we've got uh, normal things we do with more fertility analysis, more t motility, morphology, concentration, um, some of the chromosome abnormalities uh, like a reciprocal translocation. Um, this, uh, I would say this used to be really a kind of a constant. We always expected uh, really good bore fertility out of, uh, out of the studs. We've seen a couple of things that have thrown us curveballs here the last couple of years with regard to uh, packaging a semen, um, and that uh, that uh, that have given us headaches with regard to total born, but not necessarily conception rates. Uh, the industry's tried uh, a bit on so ovulation synchronization. That seems uh, a bit of a dead technology right now. Tremendous value in in that, but uh, still struggling with really 
uh, return on investment with that and uh, trying to understand how it's best placed within systems. Um, you can see movement uh, into sex semen with, um, we've seen it a lot on the cattle side and it's moving into the pig side as the technology continues to get better. Uh, so uh, some, some companies are starting to use this a little bit, but not very far along. And then frozen semen's always kind of been one of the, one of the Achilles heels of, of genetic progression within the swine industry. Uh, I've not figured out a way to really freeze semen and still have good viability with regard to those, uh, uh, saving those sires. With PCI, there's a number of advantages and that's why, uh, that's why it's getting rolled into the system. Uh, the bore indexing is definitely uh, one of the greatest advantages of that, and uh, that'll translate into uh, to our grow finish performance. And then also on the multiplication side, trying to ins improve genetic progress of that herd um, and trying to pair up those really high-performing sires with your high-indexing gilts as you're making those, um, those single-sire matings. Labor is, uh, is an advantage with regard to PCAI. Uh, decreased time, and then where it's really been a value in, in 6,000 head sow farms is you can really go to, to really almost one breeder or two. So you can have, we've really really um, pulled that back where you might have one guy, when I say one breeder, there's usually two guys doing it, but you may have one guy making all the heat decisions and placing the, the rod and then somebody coming up behind him, squeezing semen in, doing records, and, and really not making decisions. So you can take these 6,000 head sow farms really move to one key sow breeder and one key gilt breeder and have uh, better consistency there. You also see that uh, just reduces the burnout. Uh, there's been a number of studies done with regular AI where uh, uh, performance in the first hour or two is tremendous and then as they continue to breed and get burned out there, um, you'll see that. Uh, there's uh, potentially reduced semen cost on a lot of the PCA AI doses that I see, it'll be anywhere from like 15 cents to 50 cents a dose with regard to reduction in the, in the cost. Um, uh, that's not necessarily uh, 100%. And then improved reproductive performance, you'll notice I put uh, that in both categories. And so really with PCAI, and I'll go through some of the data, we don't see a lot of difference with regard to total born or conception rates. There's a number of risks with regard to PCAI. It's, it's been difficult in gilts. Uh, it can be done, but um, in farms where we put it in and tried to maintain it for months on end, a lot of those farms slide off of that and we go back to cervical breeding with regard to gilts. Uh, there is some additional catheter expense, so our reduced semen cost is really eaten up by catheter expense for the most part. Uh, it takes training and rollout, which is, um, you, you need to be structured with that, but it's not necessarily um, undoable. But then uh, you'll see drift with time. So as, as you uh, continue to watch those farms and ask them, for example, what percent of the sows are you getting catheters passed in? Well, they'll move to 100%. Well, that's, that's not, uh, not what we would expect. And so you've got to continue to kind of come back and retrain, uh, retrain those farms. And then on the reproductive performance side, yeah. Um, again, we usually don't see much, uh, much effect, but I would say there's less margin for error because we're only putting one or 1.5 billion uh, sperm in the reproductive tract. So the true goal of, of PCI is how low can I titrate that dose uh, down to so that I don't see any decrease in fair rate or any decrease in um, total born. There's been a number of studies uh, that have been done trying to look in titrate dosages and see where that's at. Um, still using the one to three billion sperm cells. Uh, that seems to be getting a little bit lower or better as uh, extenders continue to improve and as we get better with regard to heat check and, and looking at that. So a lot of the PCI doses that I see is 1.5 billion. That kind of seems to be where people are relatively um, comfortable. Here was a study done um, in, that looked at uh, AI versus PCAI and had the three, two, and one billion doses, used all the same volume with regard um, to extender in there, the doses, and then you can see how ferrin rates change with, uh, with time there. So uh, really not a lot of difference between three and two, whether that was AI or PCAI with regard to both ferrin rates and uh, total born. But there's definitely a tipping point here as we get to uh, one billion with regard to both PCAI doses coming down and total born coming down, and then especially on the AI doses, 
uh, really seeing a lot of difference there. So um, some of the, uh, so on where to get, or Jason, what, what do you guys add on your Birchwood doses? 70, 70 mil. 70 mil? 2.75. Then 2.75. And then the PCI doses, are you guys just cutting that in a half or? Yeah, so Jason says, and, and that's uh, what, uh, what a lot of studs I'm working with are doing. So uh, 70 mil, uh, 2.75 live cells, and really just cutting that in half um, with regard to uh, the PCI dose. As, um, as we rolled this into the Carthage system, um, here's a look at uh, PCI versus traditional doses and uh, really looking kind of at the same time here. This was probably about three-ish years ago. Um, so 17 different farms rolled into uh, PCI services was about 16,000, 17,000 services and about 37,000 services traditional at that period of time. And really just showing the, the difference in total born between the two, uh, really not much difference, two tenths there. Um, so again, makes you feel comfortable uh, with regard to, um, to rolling that out into systems. Um, here's a, another farm that uh, would have been on standard, uh, uh, standard doses, and then we did um, PCAI, but used the full 70 mil dose uh, here, and then moved to a 35 mil dose at 1.5 billion uh, there. And so uh, they were at... Um, um, 1307 well, on uh, sows, 12.3 at full dose, and a 12.5 on PCI. So not really seeing much uh, change there with regard to total born, but generally not necessarily seeing an improvement in total born um, in those farms. Here's another farm that uh, would have been uh, very, or same, same type of program, standard cervical matings. 70 mil dose PCI and then uh, going to the 35 mil dose PCI and really staying pretty standard across there. This was this data was uh, total born by day bred, so I was trying to be um, trying to look for small signals with regard to. Um, so that's why there's a significant variation on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the one of the issues with PCAI is uh, we're saying you can save labor and you can go faster, and so so then we screw up the basics with regard to breeding and heat check. Um, so that's why it's really important that uh, the basics are still king, and you and you still reinforce the the three key components of that. So heat check, uh, the bore exposure, and hand stimulation. As the teams uh, doing heat check and and looking uh, looking to go there because they aren't stopping and breeding those cervically, uh, they move a heck of a lot faster. Um, so you can see them, um, you can see them really move past there on those, uh, if anybody uses the bore bot, that's probably one of the bad things about the bore bot. Now it's got two speeds. And so uh, they, they wanna crank it up into high speed there. Um, identification of sows and heat. So who's, how am I gonna make that decision to, that I need a breeder now, or we're, we're on a 12 hour delay or 24 hour delay. And then that timing of insemination prior to ovulation. Uh, one of the big changes that, uh, that we've made in PCAI 3.0, if we want to call it that, is that um, there's been uh, the original protocols were to breed with the bore or uh, heat check, put the bore up, come back um, an hour later, and uh, complete the PCAI, PCAI. And that was to try and improve the, uh, the percentage of inner rods that pass there. Um, so when you've got uh, sow and estrus, you'll see a big spike in oxytocin, and oxytocin contracts smooth muscles. And so the reproductive tract has a lot of smooth muscles in it with regard to the uterus and the cervix. And so that causes both uterine contractions and then clamping down of the cervix, which is uh, the way that, uh, that, that boars ejaculate um, and are stimulated to do that when they're servicing sows. And so you get a natural response then to facilitate semen uh, movement through the cervix and um, through the uterus. So you'll see that, uh, that, that oxytocin release also correlates with the standing reflex of the sows. Within about 10 minutes, you'll see that sow and gilt become refractory. And then she's, she's got a, uh, a period or a latent period there where she can't respond again to bore exposure for about an hour until she would give her bore exposure and stimulation again. Here's that, um, that chart of how oxytocin release uh, looks in those animals. So they've got a low basal 
Um, so this is uh, in minutes here, low basal concentration. As you introduce that bore in stimulator, then she has an oxytocin release, shows us clinical signs of estrus, uh, has the smooth muscle contraction there, and you can see that that uh, spikes very high, falls down after about 10 minutes, and then comes back down to that basal time period. Um, when um, Carthage rolled this out into the uh, Breedween farms that we oversee the first year, we did uh, like the standard industry protocol, uh, heat check, put the bore up, come back an hour later, and go ahead and breed those. The, about the last two years, we've made a switch and just breed with the bore in front. Our experience has been there's been really no difference in catheter passage rates, and so um, the percentage of sows that aren't that we can't pass the catheter in was really no different when we had the bore present or not. No difference in total born and conception rates. Uh, the thing that things that I like about it quite a bit are that it slows the team down when they're doing heat check. And so now, since I'm heat checking, putting rods in and breeding, I'm still moving and I'm moving relatively fast, but not near as fast as when I was just checking sows and, and basically almost, if, if your guys heat checking or walking with their hips this way instead of this way against the crates, it's, uh, it's a bit of an issue. So it's, it slows them down to give them more bore exposure. Uh, it does speed up the breeding team because everything's still out while they're breeding so they can get done, put everything away versus have to go, um, go grab their supplies and come back again. And then uh, it also incre increases the breeding compliance on the non-PCAI sows or the ones that do not uh, allow passing the inner catheter. Um, so here's, uh, here's the slide set on how, um, how we typically roll out and train uh, farms. Um, so this is a protocol on uh, if we were going to go into a farm and train, but um, do use the boars in front during insemination. We like to put all the, when you wean, kick out the P1 so that way you can have them all together with regard to how you're going to bore expose and heat check them. And then also as you get into them and your PCAI in those, it's good to have you, have you think, okay, I got my 20 P1s together. Um, maybe a little harder to, um, for us to pass that inner rod. Um, oh, yeah. So 20, 25% won't accept uh, PCA. That's an important question to ask as you're auditing the process is how many are you having to pull the inner rod on or at least that you hang around long enough to watch and see because there should be some of these that don't pass the inner rod on. So if they're at 100%, you've got, uh, they're, they're uh, not feeling it quite right. Um, females that can't take the inner rod will breed traditional. Um, I would say that it seems like uh, 50 to 75% of the time they will take the PCA rod the second time if we'll do that. A lot of times we'll take that, if she doesn't take it the first time, when we pull that inner rod out, we'll tie it on the crate there. So that way when you come back around tomorrow at a breeder again, you know uh, that she didn't take it the first time. We'll still try, and uh, most of the time she'll take that, that inner rod, but not necessarily all the time. And then it's also the farms have to manage inventory of PCAI doses and then full doses, and so they've got to just remember that, uh, if, if, that I need to give her two PCAI doses or one full dose of semen if I've got to breed her cervically. Um, Again, pictures, necropsy, et cetera, are really good as you guys are training these teams. So um, showing them where the cervical rings are and how far that foam rod extends into the uterine body and um, that are all critical things there. Um, heat, ex heat check and procedure are, are really just like they've been doing before. So that's important to note with them is that we're gonna continue to heat check just like we have been. We're gonna give them 30 seconds of bore stimulation, hand exposure, uh, pressing on the back, pulling up on the flanks. We like to use a lot of the uh, tarp straps. Um, I always, always kind of pains me as I sit in my brother's tractor and plant corn with him, all the technology he uses, and then I say, well, we're breeding sows with tarp straps. Um, you'd think we'd have something mechanical that could find sows in heat, but um, as, as you're hand stimulating them and they're showing, I mean, that's one of the things we'll use to lock up sows is take a 42 inch tarp strap and lock it up around sows, make sure that she's really in good, good standing heat there to make sure, um, make sure she's ready and designated. Sanitation is important. Remember, we're, some of the defense mechanisms of the vagina and the cervix uh, we're bypassing with regard to PCAI. So having 
uh, having really clean back environments, wiping down vulvas, um, because you're going to pass that inner rod straight into the uterus there are, are important with the teams. Um, handling that rod, uh, making sure that they aren't touching, aren't touching anything that's going to enter the sow, they're keeping their hands down. Um, and then uh, for the most part, or, uh, we'll still continue to use a little bit of lube on those, on those rods. Um, typically we'll do kind of one of two things. If you're breeding by yourself, we'll typically have a breeder breed up to five sows at the same time. So you can go ahead and designate five and heat, um, come and pass, pass the first rod in the, or put the, the foam catheter into the cervix of those five. And then when he's done with that, it's usually been about two minutes. He can go back and try and pass the inner rod on those five come back and then do the five semen doses. So they kind of do everything in fives if they're working by themselves. The other way that um, it seems to flow well is uh, if you've got uh, two guys working the line, uh, we'll usually use two bore bots. And so you've got one guy that's working ahead and he's the one that's doing all the heat check and he puts the first foam rod in and then continues to move down the line. The second guy's got a second trailer bore and he's the one passing the inner catheter, putting the dose in and writing the records down. And so they may get spread out. They may be uh, 40 crates or whatever between the two of them, but they're working, working there together. The reason I like that is because if, I can't, if I'm the second guy and I can't get the inner rod to go in, I can pull it out. I got my bore there and we just continue to, continue to the, the lead guy continues to go. If you got just one bore on a bot, you've got to say, hey, back that thing up here so I can breed that, that uh, sow and everybody kind of has to stop there. Um, on the inner rod, that's, uh, that's the touch or the, the feel there on uh, trying to get that through. Um, usually uh, put the foam rod in, wait a minute or two, try and pass the inner rod. Most of the times it'll go right away. If it doesn't, um, wait another few minutes, come back and uh, try that again. Um, once they've got that rod, when they think is inserted, uh, have them push on the outer rod. If the uh, inner rod pushes back out or stays there, then it's probably not uh, inserted correctly. That should all slide together if you've truly got that inner catheter through that cervix. Um, the, uh, if they can't get that inner rod in after f about five minutes, which is really about three attempts, then we'll have them pull that inner rod Reader traditional AI and uh, and move on. Um, semen handling, we just got to as you train on this, it's important to go ahead and just retrain on the things that are important with regard to breeding about semen rotation, shelf life, etc. Um, connect the semen dose. We like using uh, this style of uh, bottle over the bags just because it's easier to squeeze and go ahead and uh, put that in there. If they squeeze, uh, squeeze a half a dose and check for any backflow, there should be zero backflow uh, in these situations. So if you see backflow coming out of the vagina, then that rod is not even close to in the cervix and it's coming back, back out there. Uh, a lot of times, instead of seeing um, backflow there, what you'll see is you'll see backflow um, between the inner rod and the foam rod. And so that's, um, that's pushing semen back up between the two. Any, any pushback means that you've got, uh, you don't have it in the right spot. You can sometimes pull that inner rod a little bit and try and readjust, but most of the time, whenever you've got that thing kinked down there, you're kind of done with it. One of the good QC things you can do with the team when you're training that is if you've got one that doesn't seem placed right or you've got that issue, have them pull out that inner rod and you can look and see if there's any kinks in that thing. If you see a kink in it, then, um, then you can reinforce it. Okay, you're making a good decision. It wasn't in the right spot. We've got to re just breed a regular cervical AI, and let's move on. Um, <coughs> then uh, when they're done breeding, we'll have them remove or pull back that uh, inner rod, and then do uh, rotations and cervical stimulation of the sow. <coughs> I was uh, corresponding with Dr. Connor yesterday to say, hey, I can't really find the reference to this uh, uh, this production practice there, and. Um, it's actually, it's, uh, it's pretty common or it's, it was done in some of the Danish, um, some of the Danish research. So the Danes do a great job of putting out some published research out of their systems. And this is one of the things that, that they found is critical. Uh, after, uh, after that's done, um, 
move to uh, usage of, of what we call soaker bores, so letting bores, just flooding that alloy with a bunch of bores uh, and letting them continue to stimulate and try and improve. Remember, you've got, uh, it probably took an hour to do that and show she's receptive to another oxytocin release. And with oxytocin release, you get uterine contraction. So what you're trying to promote there is pushing semen up towards those oviducts and flooding that uh, front alleyway with bores for one to two hours after you're uh, complete there. Um, again, the P1s, putting those together require, or allows you to really identify where you've got to uh, slow down with heat check and PCAI. Um, push hard the weaned first service uh, feed intake of those sows. Um, scrape those sows, uh, feed multiple times a day. Really try and push if you can get seven pounds, eight pounds into them um, there prior to breeding. Um, so again, this is some of that protocol on some of the farms will hand feed with, um, and so helping them understand, give them a scoop, she's good. Uh, uh, don't worry about that one either. Um, and then uh, checking sows for lameness and those sorts of issues. A couple of slides here on gilts. So um, uh, gilts are, gilts are uh, they're our largest population of sows that we're breeding with regard to parity. And then it also, as you think about multiplication, they're, uh, they're a really important part of herd turnover and genetic indexing. So our ability to PCI and gilts is uh, really pretty important. Uh, but they're really difficult uh, because of the cervix size, age, weight, uh, genetic differences, catheter size, what's the flexibility of that catheter, and then how many estruses do I have in those. Um, uh, again, this re reinforces what are the keys with regard to gilt breeding. So uh, this is a, a short study that, that uh, categorized gilts into type one and type two gilts. So a type one gilt were uh, greater than 280 pounds at first heat in an H&S row, at least 15 days on crates and full feed, 300 pounds at mating, at least one H&S and no PG600. And type two gilts didn't meet any one of the previous five um, requirements there. Here's um, a look at total born on those uh, two different type, type one gilts or the ones that we believe are correct development. Type two didn't meet those five criteria. So you can see here uh, what's the total born of uh, the type one uh, gilts versus the type two. So you see those type two gilts, a lot of really poor litters. Uh, so the percentage of litters with less than nine total born, 30% on those versus 4% on uh, type one gilts. So one of the things that's key to continue to remember with regard to PCI and breeding is just, are we hitting these five parameters? And I, I really like the categorization to say, you gotta hit all five to be a type one gilt. Um, and that's a metric that farms can use. Um, Here's another look at that uh, with regard to those 322 farrowings. So a uh, two pig total born difference uh, between those two uh, and very consistent uh, all the way through depending on uh, period. And uh, this is an AI period and then uh, really critical on a PCAI period. It was almost, uh, it was four, 4.3 pigs difference PCAI versus non-PCAI. So uh, if you don't have good gilt development uh, PCI and gilts is probably one to back off of. Um, when you're uh, breeding gilts with PCI, that, that inner rod or inner catheter will not go the full distance. That's uh, where you see a lot of issues with farms is that they'll, uh, they'll expect to bury that thing in there just like a sow uterus would. So you'll still have about two to three inches of the catheter that'll show. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll mark uh, the cervical distance on that inner catheter with a marker to say, okay, here's, this would be beginning of service, cervix, this would be the end of the cervix, and then you don't have to get that last couple inches in there to help them visualize as they're feeling and going through there, how that ought to work. Um, so the confidence in the technician is difficult to get to, um, but that necropsy and showing what the uterus looks like and marking that catheter sure seems to help. Um, uh, here you'll see quite a bit, or you can see more leak back just because your success rate on getting through the cervix is lower. So, um, so this is uh, telling them uh, what, uh, how, we, how we adjust or manage that. Um, there's a lot of frustration and tendency to go too fast with gilts. Um, and so your sow breeders that are doing this are not necessarily the best people to go ahead and once you're done with the sow row, go move over to the gilt row. Typically they can never, Gilt breeders can never really get into a rhythm because uh, I got to pull a lot out and breed cervical with the boar. 
Um, so it's uh, usually those are two separate teams. Uh, here's a little bit of data looking at um, PCI versus uh, traditional AI on gilts only. Um, so uh, on ferro rates, uh, PCI at 90.2. This is a farm startup, so we had we had a lot of gilts to breed here, and we did uh, did both and and looked at it here. So traditional AI was at 93%, PCI at 90%. Um, got along uh, good there. Here's uh, the total born over the top of each other, and really was um, no difference between the two uh, there. Um, so. Um, in, in a startup herd here, really good success with regard to PCI versus traditional AI. But what we've seen, so like in this herd, we don't continue to breed gilts with PCI. What we found is that over over time, as you get away from uh, really intensively being able to oversee that and get into normal production, uh, it's been difficult to sustain long term. So like in the Carthage system, we aren't doing hardly any of the, the farms gilts PCI anymore because it's just been difficult to um, to try and get that done. The success rate on PCI is uh, really 50-ish percent to maybe 75 percent uh, with regard to doing that. So the team's got to continue about every, one out of every two um, so, or gilts. We've got to pull the inner rod out and uh, go ahead and breed them cervical. Um, so as you, in summary, as you guys think about PCI, I think it's important with regard to how to implement it or the decision to implement it in the system is where are you on the value matrix side of things. So uh, if you're a boar stud or you own a boar stud, it's, it's a kind of a no-brainer to do because you can either just increase throughput through the stud or truly get that genetic index improvement by cutting down the inventory. If you're, um, if you're buying semen out of a stud uh, that's really, 100% sold out and you go to PCI, you're probably not gonna get a huge improvement in index because they're a sold out boar stud. Um, so that's one of the things to discuss uh, or think about whether you own the stud or whether you're buying semen out of a stud is really, is it truly gonna change the indexing of that stud if, if you go to it or does everybody in the stud need to go to it? So it's an important question to have or an important thing to discuss with uh, as you're thinking about uh, maybe rolling to PCI. On the sow herd side, there's really not much of a production improvement that I believe uh, you would see other than just uh, labor and uh, efficiencies. And some of that labor is time, but a lot of that is now I, now I don't have to have a team of three breeding sows, I can really have my one, my one key guy do that, especially as you think about weekend, uh, weekend labor and that. And then on grow finish, it's, uh, it's really uh, back to that original boar stud question. It's gotta be throughput um, or uh, index um, and performance there. You need to, to roll it out and plan for flawless implementation. Um, so this is um, uh, what, how we, we did it in the Carthage system was we had one trainer that went around and trained all 25 or whatever the sow farms. So they, they went and spent a week at the farm, uh, left and went to another farm for a week, and then they would come back to that farm for two, three days just to make sure that it was, that it was uh, properly implemented. You've gotta have really clear SOPs uh, I've said it a bunch of times, but show if you show them what they can't see, it really clicks for them when they can see what a cervix looks like and how that rod lays in there. Um, so those are those are important things as you think about rolling in a, into a system. The other thing I would say is if if you've got one farm, there's some good, really good resources with regard to the genetic companies uh, like PIC on um, on people that can come and help your teams um, go ahead and implement them. So. Think about what are your external resources that you can use to roll it into the system.